Welcome to The Struggle is Real, a show for 20-somethings that are trying to figure out adulting. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Each episode, we focus on solving a problem that we will face throughout this defining decade that wasn't covered in the classroom. This could include topics about our career, health, relationships, and money. Let's get into it. Joining me on the podcast today is Rose Lounsbury, a simplicity coach, speaker, and author of the book, Less, Minimalism for Real. Rose's minimalist journey started with being an overwhelmed mom. And I mean, really overwhelmed. She is the mom of triplets, as in three kids. I could not imagine starting out being a mother by, you know, inheriting three kids. (laughs) That just seems insane to me. She would come home from work, start her second shift of being a mom, and finally get done putting her three two-year-olds to bed just in time to spend her last waking hour cleaning up the mess from the day. Rose was tired of this, but didn't know what to do until a friend mentioned minimalism. She immediately resonated with the lifestyle and spent the next year purging 70% of her possessions. Rose found this lifestyle to be so impactful that she began applying simplification to other areas of her life, such as money and her career. Now, Rose helps overwhelmed people create space in their homes, their workspaces, and most importantly, their minds by letting go of the excess stuff that gets in the way. I had a professional organizer on The Struggle is Real before. That was episode 33 with Lucy Milligan-Wall. So I don't spend a whole lot of time on home organizing tips. I suggest that you guys go check out that episode if you want to really do a deep dive into that topic. Instead, we talked a lot about how the concept of simplifying can be applied to different areas of your life. We also start the conversation discussing overachievement and the negative impact associated with defining yourself by how much you've gotten done. You also know my standard final question, and I really loved Rose's answer. She absolutely brought it home and left me so energized, so stick around for that. I hope you enjoy my conversation with the former middle school teacher, Amazon best-selling author, and still sane mom of triplets, Rose Lounsbury. Let's talk cut or cut pack. At any point in time, did you feel like you might get a bad haircut from your kids or were you pretty gung-ho about making sure this that your 40,000 words got finished? It was so motivating that I was sure. There was no way that I was going to allow that to happen. And what was funny is my kids also were scared about the chance that they would have to cut my hair. They said, mom, I don't think, I don't think I can do it. I, I, I can't, I wouldn't do that to you. I'm like, you have to. And then one of one of the triplets, Orlando, kind of took up the mantle. He's like, yeah, mom, I'll, I'll do it. I'll give you a horseshoe, you know, haircut. <laughs> so the place that I hesitated with it was thinking, do I really want to put this out there? Do I really want to send this email to my list and commit to this? Because once I did that, then I couldn't back out. It was really the, the putting it out there to other people, the actual packed part of it. Once I put the packed out there, I knew I would do it because the consequence of the haircut was so terrible. <laughs> yeah. So once I, once I sent the email, I was like, I am finishing all 40,000 words of this. Yes. By the deadline. And I did. And I was did you myself. publish the book? I didn't see. I have, I have not. I have not yet. And that is, that is a thing that I probably should do another cut or cut packed for. So it's written. What's interesting is I was just thinking about this yesterday. My goal is to publish it by the end of 2022. And I think I'm going to self-publish. Part of what was holding me up was I thought, well, I really want to get a traditional publisher. And that's dependent on so many other external factors. And I kind of had to let go of the idea that I needed a traditional publisher. I mean, I've self-published my first book. So I'm I'm going to do self-publishing for the second book. And I actually, it's, it's good that it's taken this long. It's been about a year since I finished the first draft of it, the first manuscript. Because now I have a greater clarity in my business and who I'm serving and what I'm doing. And I actually just yesterday was thinking, I want to kind of reorganize the sections into the three different things that I really am talking about now. And I can utilize a lot of the same content. But I feel like writing that book almost was more for me to process the changes that I was going through. And now I feel like I can utilize the things I wrote, most of what I wrote, probably 75, 80 percent in a framework that's really going to help the women that I want to serve. So yes, I haven't published it, but I'm actually seeing the benefits of that because I think the way that I want to publish it now is going to be better. Mm, That's cool. 
what's the benefit of having a traditional publisher versus self-publishing? I guess all the services that they provide. What did you find from your first sub self-publishing exploration that you're like, I need a traditional publisher now? You know, honestly, it's probably more of an ego thing because I felt like having a traditional, and this was what I had to get over, having a traditional publisher to me felt more legitimate. You're a real author. You know, you have Simon Schuster or Penguin or whoever like publishing you. So you're the real deal. Yes, you will get more distribution in a wider space like Target and that sort of thing. Like they will put your book in those places. But it was more because I think it would feed my ego to be published traditionally. And I thought that that was somehow better than self-publishing. And so I had to sort of get over that. And also when I did self-publish my first book, it's actually kind of a hybrid. I worked with a publisher who's not actually like technically a publishing company, but they did all of the self-publishing stuff that I didn't want to have to figure out. Like they got it on Amazon. They did the design, the layout, the cover, all of those things that you know, I could hire them again, or I could learn how to do those things myself because I honestly don't think it's that hard. And they did coaching on launch, which is another thing I've heard when you use a traditional publisher, they still expect you to run the launch. They expect you to work your own list, you know, do giveaways, do bonuses, do pre-order things. So even with a, a traditional publisher, they're not actually really selling the book for you. It's still on you as the author to sell the book. And so I thought, well, you know, I, I sent some things out to different publishers. I don't know, maybe I would again, but I honestly feel like I know enough from that first experience to probably do it on my own and get it out there to my people and to my audience. So yeah, that's kind of where, where that's at. Yeah, I have a fair amount of authors that come on the podcast. So I get to hear some of the back end on these conversations all the time. And I see and hear more and more of them going the self-publishing route. And I find that interesting. I think lots of the industries shift towards this more DIY, -er. and especially if like, of course, I don't, I don't know enough about the publishing industry to realize or have an opinion on the value they provide and if it's worth the you know royalty that you're going to give away for that. But it seems like the self-publishing route is not only becoming more popular, but also it's like just the preferred method since you're going to have to go out and do the book tour all on your own anyway. <laughs> and do all of this and get the sales and whatnot. I see it very similar to the podcasting space with, you know, wanting to be a part of a podcast network versus being a kind of self-authored or self-produced podcast like my own as well. And just like you, it's really fascinating to be like, and understand why I want to be moving towards something. At first, I was like, I, I kind of want to be on a network at some point in time. And then I was like, why do I really want to be on a network? <laughs> Like, are they going to help me solve something that I can't currently solve? Or just like you, was it just an ego thing? <laughs> Which is actually really surprising that you've come to that conclusion and you're comfortable voicing that, that as well. Yeah, and it's interesting because the whole book that I wrote was about overachieving and how I was simplifying and kind of letting go of this aspect of myself where I wanted to like get the gold stars and be the A-plus student and the number one volunteer and all those things. Even while writing that book about that topic, the way that I thought I had to publish it was in that same attitude, right? Where I have to have the best way. I have to get a real publisher to publish my book. So it's legitimized by this external approval. And, and I actually had a friend who read it early coffee. She kind of like really gently pointed that out to me. And I was like, no, 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 that, that's not it. <laughs> and then, you know, in reflecting it, I'm like, actually, yeah, that kind of is it. Coupled with a bit of fear over having to figure out, okay, because I had these other people helping me last time, like, how would I get it laid out? And I'll hire some, you know, proofreaders and interior designers. It's actually all really figure outable. And I'm willing to figure it out now. And before, I just don't think that I was. I wanted somebody, I wanted to be like, just do this for me and help me. And then it'll be so good because you're doing it and I'm not. And yeah, it's interesting that you've talked to people who kind of are going the same way, like going to self-publishing from traditional publishing. I see it more and more because also, yeah, the royalties thing, you know, I own the book. I own everything about it. I don't have to give any money to anybody else for it, which is nice. That's got to be nice. When yeah. did the idea of writing about overachievement come to fruition for you? I was working with a coach named Leo Babauta. I don't know if he runs the blog Zen Habits. Mm -hmm. It's been in on the Internet for a million years. 
And so I was coaching with him. I'd read his blog for years. It was the first minimalist blog I ever read. And then I kind of got in some of his programs and I was working with him. And he was kind of the one who really helped me see that, yes, you've, you've simplified your physical stuff. You've simplified a lot of things in your life. But I guess I kept thinking, like, why do I still feel so harried and so crazy and not at peace, actually, in a lot of ways, which is why I sought out coaching with him. Like, I still don't feel at peace. I still don't feel satisfied. I still feel like I'm always afraid of failing. Like, why is that? Because I've done these things that I thought were supposed to fix me. And he just has a really skillful and gentle way of helping you see the things that you're afraid of and the things you need to work on. And so a lot of the things he helped me work on were these feelings that I needed to always be doing to be okay or to be good or to be approved of or to be good enough. It it sort of illuminated that for me, like you've always felt like you're not good enough. That's kind of the root problem of all of this. And even though you're not buying things to try to fix that anymore, now you're trying to achieve, and you always actually have been, but you're continuing that behavior of trying to achieve to be good enough. And so I, I recognized it, that this was something I had to declutter or simplify, but it's so much harder for me than a closet because a closet is very tangible, very visible. You take out the things you don't want. You put them in a donation bag and drop them off at the Goodwill and there they stay. Mm-hmm. When it's your psyche and your ego that you're dealing with, those gremlins can come right back in within the next five, 10 minutes and you're dealing with them again. And so I realized that this was going to be a deeper and more challenging and probably more lifelong work than the decluttering of my house, which I, I did in about eight months. And yes, I have to maintain it and simplify and keep doing it, but it's not the same as the mental habits and patterns that we've established since childhood that are not serving us and that lead to us feeling really anxious all the time. So it was really his work that kind of got me going in that direction. And, you know, it's been a continual process, I'll say. I have made immense progress, but I continue to work on it. And I think I've kind of accepted that I'll continue to work on it. There's no end goal, right? There's no final, I'm done. I've done all the personal development and now I'm 100% healed, cured, aligned and connected. (laughs) All is good. And I think that that's, that actually is a symptom of the achievement mindset. Like you're going to get to the place and then you'll be good. You're going to win work. You're going to win life. You're going to win relationships and you're going to have the gold star and the trophy and all of it. And that's not how any of it actually works. So I think a big part was just accepting that this is my own personal life's work. And as I started sharing it with my audience, I got such incredible, overwhelming feedback that I realized I'm not the only one suffering with this because I think that's also the perception is, oh, I'm the only one who always feels like a failure. I'm the only one who talks to herself in this horrible way and feels like she's never good enough. And so those early blog posts, like now I'm much more comfortable telling my readers like, hey, I'm insecure. <laughs> I'm okay saying that. But the first few times that I, I put those posts out there, I was like, why am I telling people? <laughs> this just feels awful. But then, you know, they responded to me unlike anything I'd ever written before. Mm. And so that reaffirmed me and helped me know like, okay, this is not only helping me to uncover these things in myself, but it's actually, I think, helping other people to not feel so alone and just to know that all of us struggle. You know, you talk about the struggle is real. That's the name of your podcast. And that struggle is to a certain degree universal. You know, my, my, one of my, I have triplets. One of my boys the other day was just really down. They'll be 13 in a couple months. And so, you know, they're approaching that really difficult time of life. 12, 13, 14 is really hard. And so one of my boys was just really down and really sad. And I was like, you know, what's going on? And he didn't want to talk to me. And then we went on a walk and he talked to me because we weren't looking at each other. And he just started crying. And he's like, mom, I'm just, I don't feel like I'm good at anything. Reese, his brother, Reese is good at everything. I'm not as good as him. I'm not good at anything. I don't know what I'm good at. And I'm like, oh God, these are the same things adults struggle with. We don't feel like we're good enough. We don't feel like we're successful. We're comparing ourselves to everybody else. And so it's really a universal feeling. It's a universal thing. And so me writing about it was probably me starting to deal with things I've struggled with since I was a kid and will probably continue to feel challenged by 
until I'm an old, old woman, but it's worth working on because it makes you just feel such relief in your life. Because the only other option, and, and Brene Brown talks about this, she talks about the midlife unraveling, where she says about, you know, your mid thirties, you're, you're either gonna, you're gonna have a midlife unraveling. She doesn't call it a crisis. And it goes from midlife to the rest of your life. Like it doesn't end. And so she said, your two options, one is to face it, get into the shit and deal with it. And the other option is to like double down on perfectionism and just like white knuckle it mm. and be miserable. And so I'm choosing to like sort of just let myself unravel, drop the facade and be open about what I struggle with. And I think that's the healthier option. It's, it's not easier, but it's healthier. I, I would agree with that. And I think it resonates with so many people. I mean, everybody can probably has a little bit of addiction to achievement. And I really resonated with that whenever I was reading those parts of your blogs and listening to you talk about this. And I love the direction that you're headed. And it's like so surprising coming from the, you know, captain of the debate team, the leader of the marching band, the valid Victorian. And <laughs> I was just like, how does someone that has hit so many highs at different points of her life still think about this and still struggle with this? I think you're right. It's just got to be one of those ongoing struggles. And I haven't really found any great ways to completely rid myself of this addiction to achievement. But has there been anything that you have found, you know, over, you know, starting this journey and things that you've written about in, in your book that people might be able to consider if they are struggling in this area? Probably the thing I started doing that made the biggest difference first, because I tried meditation and I still do do some meditation and I, I believe in all of that. But for me, it's really hard to do that sitting still and being quiet. And I think a lot of people struggle with that. Gratitude practice I found to be more tangible and helpful than meditation when I first started. So, you know, everybody talks about gratitude. Oprah talks about it. Everyone's like, be grateful to practice gratitude. And I kind of had this really skeptical attitude toward gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I thought, saying what you're thankful for, okay, like, how's that really going to help you feel better? But, you know, when that's your approach, it probably is a signal that you should practice some gratitude. So I just had just a little plain journal and I said, okay, every morning I'm going to write down five things that I'm grateful for in the morning. And then every evening before I go to bed, I'm going to write down five things I'm grateful for before I go to bed. And I will be honest, initially this felt really wooden. It felt really forced. And I was like, I just don't know if this is working. But what happens over time, over, you know, practicing it and doing this over and over again, is I realized that it started to bookend my day in a much healthier way than I'd previously bookended it. So the way I used to wake up in the morning was I woke up like, what do I got to get done today? I got to do this, this, this. Where's the list? Let's get it done. Let's start checking things off. And the way that I would end the day was a review. Okay, what did what'd you do? Oh, you didn't get that done. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. Oh my God, how are you going to, you didn't do all these things. So it was like, I started the day and ended the day by evaluating my worth against my to-do list, either what I had to do at the beginning or what I had not done at the end. And so I usually woke up anxious and went to bed feeling defeated. Mm. And when I switched to saying, first thing I'm going to do is, is practice gratitude, it wakes you up in a different way. And at the end of the day, even on really crappy days where I'm just like, today kind of sucked. And this will even happen just like a few days ago. I'm like, what am I going to write down? And then I'm like, you know what? You've got clean, fresh water in this house. Everyone in this house is healthy. And you have three kids. Like It, it makes you realize that you actually are living a really blessed life. And I, I start to think about, you know, people at the ends of their life. I think there's a lot of clarity when you're elderly and you're kind of approaching the end of your life and you reflect back. And if you talk to older people, you know, they'll tell you such wisdom and they talk about the things that matter and, you know, being with people you love and doing things that you love. And I actually think that the gratitude practice at the beginning and ending of the day, especially, is like a little mini practice for reflecting on your life as a whole, like reflecting on your day and finding five little things you are grateful for, you will start to realize that the things you're grateful for over and over again are the same, similar, small, simple things. Like I realized I'm so grateful for taking my dog for a walk. I love walking Rudy every day. I'm grateful for time that I spend with my kids. If we go to the library or we do a board game or something together and you start to notice the patterns of gratitude in your life, 
And those are the things that really matter in your life because I don't think I've ever put, I'm so grateful that I got my email to zero. I'm so (laughs) grateful that I checked 10 things off the to-do list. I don't feel called to put those things. Yes, sometimes the things are related to work. Like, I'm so grateful for a new client that came in. I'm so grateful for a wonderful session. I'm so grateful for all the amazing women in my program. I will be grateful for them. And I am. But the main themes are the simple everyday things. And so it just changes the way you start and end your day. And it's a very simple, tangible, physical thing you can do that will actually really has the power to shift your mindset and your approach. And it it can help kind of get you out of that overachieving or achievement oriented approach to your day. I would agree. And I have a journaling practice as well. And something I've recently implemented was completing the phrase, something I'm proud of today is, because I was struggling just like you were, you know, going to bed defeated because I have this monster to-do list. I overcommitted to too many things. I actually loved your red pen, pencil method too. So I grabbed that and took that. But I have this monster to-do list and every single day, I don't finish everything everything on that list. I'm achievement focused as well. So, you know, rather than looking at the 20 things I did do, I look at the two things I didn't do. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And I finally got tired of that. And I'm like, you know what? I need to start realizing all of the work that I'm putting in, all of the progress that I've been making and like literally tangibly write some of these things down. Uh, So that hit my journal recently and it's been a nice practice of mine. Nice. So it's something that you're proud of about yourself for the day. Yes. Yes. I love that. I love that. It kind of reminds me, some people do like a to did list. Like I did this today. At the end of the day, they write down the things that they did. So yeah, I think any way that we can make space or intentional practice for things where we honor ourselves and the things that we're accomplishing, the things we're grateful for. I just think that really makes a difference because yeah, it's really easy to look at the two things you didn't do. And the thing is, everybody has things that they didn't do. I remember when I, so my business, I started as an in-home professional organizer and I would go to people's homes and help them organize their stuff. And I had a client who was in her 60s, maybe early 70s. So she's retired. Kids are out of the house. You know, she's got this nice house. And here I am, my, my triplets were like four maybe. So I'm like super busy in my mind. I'm like the busiest woman in the world. And here I am with this woman who in my mind's got like the life of leisure And we're walking around her house and we're in her office. She's like, yeah, I've got all those papers to sort, but I just don't have time to sort them. (laughs) And I've got all these clothes I need to go through, but I just don't have time. And I'm thinking, I don't have time. What do you mean you don't have time? Like, I don't have time. You have all the time in the world. But I realize like that's sort of just a perception that we all kind of feel we don't have enough time. And I even see it again in my kids. They'll talk about, I don't have time to get all my homework done. I don't have time to do all these things. And I'm like, you are 12 and you don't have a mortgage to pay. Like, (laughs) why do you think you don't have time? But we all kind of believe that we don't have the time. And many of us operate from this perspective that there's always more to do than we can ever do. And if we don't do all the things we set out to do, then we're somehow failures. And the truth of it is, we all do have more to do than we ever could do. And the answer is to just accept that and realize that that the goals of our to-do list is not to get it all done. We will never get it all done. I tell my clients, the day your to-do list is zero is the day you die. Yeah. So you don't actually want it to be zero, right? The point of a to-do list and all these productivity things is really just to give things a place to live so they're not living in your head and spinning in your head and driving you crazy. Write it all down, but dear God, don't expect to ever do it all because you won't. You can't. And accepting that actually brings a lot of relief. Now, do I still want to do it all? Yes, I do. I do. (laughs) I know. But but I have to realize, like, I just can't, won't. And trying to or beating myself up because I don't actually really has a negative impact on my life. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that's the lifelong work. That's the checking of myself you know, of the overachieving. Yeah, you could have definitely have an endless to-do list with three kids, especially three triplets. Were you prepared for that moment? Do you remember, you know, getting the news that you're having triplets? And did you look at Josh or talk with Josh and you're like, really evaluate if you guys were capable of doing this? Because this was like your first kid and now you're going to have three first kids. That's insane. It is insane. And was I prepared? No, no, no. There was no way to prepare for it. The blessing in all of it was that we had no children. So we had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. 
So when we, and we'd gone through infertility treatments. So we were really, you know, when you've gone through infertility treatments, you kind of hope for twins because you think, let's just never go through all of that ever again. So, you know, when we found out it was triplets, we were like, we've won the lotto, right? We've, we are like the luckiest people in the world. And the truth is we are, we did win the lotto. We are the luckiest people in the world. But then I can remember, you know, as we would tell the news to people and the look on their faces, <laughs> many of them, it looked like, and the only thing I can imagine is, is like, if someone tells you they're about to head into a war zone and you just look at them like, oh God, like, I don't know what to tell them. Just God bless you, be safe, you know? <laughs> So no, we were not prepared. But the moment, you know, when they're doing the ultrasound and like we found out that there were three, we kind of just like both held hands and we were excited. But at that point, I think both of us felt like no more because, you know, they look around and, they're, and they, they hope they don't find more. But when you do fertility treatments, there's always the chance that like an embryo is hiding somewhere and they don't see it. But we were excited, you know, and, and really it was a blessing. I know I met friends when I had them who also had triplets. So you kind of like develop this triplet network. And there were some friends who had a singleton first and then triplets. And the one woman said, you know, who had a singleton and then they found out they were pregnant with triplets. Her husband did not speak for two days after hearing the news because he knew. He knew how much work one baby was. And the thought of three, he just, he could not process the information. So it was a, ignorance was absolutely bliss in that instance. It wasn't very hard. Of course, it was hard. It was really, really difficult. But I can't imagine my life any other way. You know, it's my normal. Yeah, I, I do. I feel like I'm the luckiest mom in the world and I won the lotto. I have three healthy kids and they're just, they're fantastic. Hey, this is Justin Peters from the Struggles Real Team. I hope you're enjoying the show. We're going to get right back to it after a quick message. I have so much fun interviewing the guests that come on the Struggles Real. And I try to squeeze out as much knowledge as I can. But as much as I'd love to talk to them all day, we only have a limited amount of time. Luckily, so many of my guests have condensed all of their wisdom into a book. So if you've resonated with a guest on the show, I encourage you to go check out their book. These books are incredible and I think they add a ton of value. I have all the guest books in one easy to find place. Just head over to justinpeters.co forward slash books. By purchasing books through the links on our website, you're also supporting the show. So thank you for that, as that is how we continue to expand The Struggle is Real. Now back to the episode. So of course, you quickly realized that you needed to create space and time back into your life with three kids running around and doing all the things that you were already doing. I Were you still a teacher at that time whenever you had, had your triplets? Yes. Yeah, so after I had them, I took two years of childcare leave from my teaching job so that because we don't have family that lives near us mm -hmm. and the whole just child care situation, I was like, I'm going to be paying pretty much my entire salary for the type of child care that I would sense. need for these three <laughs> premature babies. And so and I think because I'm very organized, I did not want to hand this over to somebody else until I had a system figured out that I could <laughs> hand over to someone else. You and I are such alike in that sense. <laughs> we got to systematize everything. <laughs> yes, I sensed a kinship among us. I'm like, I'm not letting some babysitter come in here and create a schedule. I have to create the schedule, test it, tweak it, and make sure it works. Then I will hand it over to somebody else. So, so yeah, so I stayed home for a couple of years. But, you know, that was really, really hard, mostly in the loss of identity from not working professionally. I am not meant to be a stay-at-home mom. And I know that there are parents out there who are meant to be stay-at-home parents and they love it. For me, it just was not fulfilling enough professionally. So I did start doing a little bit of work while they were babies for uh, Miami University. I would do some professional development workshops for teachers on how to teach writing. And so then I decided after about a year and a half that I was going to go back to the workforce full-time, go back to teaching full-time. And so we hired an au pair to live with us, which simplified not having to take them to daycare in the morning and pick them up. It also kind of cut our living space in half because with the au pair, you have to give them their own bedroom. And we also gave her her own bathroom. So she had basically the whole upper story of our little, you know, story and a half Cape Cod. And so our living space got a lot smaller. We have now three adults, three children in a, you know, 15-ish hundred square foot house, which is not humongous. And so that was kind of when the stuff started to become more tense because now I'm working full time outside the home. So I'm not home all day to kind of manage stuff. I have less space because I've given, you know, a significant portion of my house to my childcare person. And so that was kind of where 
the stuff tension really started to rile. And my time was so limited because my teaching job, I had to be there at 7 a.m. I would get home about four to relieve my up hair. And then I'm doing the mom job from four until nighttime. And then, you know, by the time the babies are in bed, I have like maybe an hour before I have to get in bed. And that hour started to be spent just managing the stuff. It's my first time of the day where I can pick up toys and shoes and sippy cups and move papers around. And so my whole day kind of went from like serving students, serving family, serving stuff, sleep and repeat. And so that was where that was kind of the point I was when the minimalism and simplicity came into my life. Yeah. So friend introduced you to the concept of minimalism and you quickly joined the bandwagon on that. It sounded like, and you purged 70% of your physical possessions in eight months time, all started with towels. And I love that story. That that's really fascinating. I like that you like went down to Josh. I think he, you said he was like playing video games or doing something. And you're like, do we need like, can, can I have two sets of towels for everybody? And I thought like, that's just a hilarious like moment where he's just like, sure. <laughs> And I'm, I'm guessing at that moment, he didn't realize what was about to ensue with, you know, losing 70% more of the possessions or letting go of them. Losing, I think, is the wrong verb there. But you found minimalism and then, of course, kind of came about this and then decided, OK, this is something that I find is super beneficial to myself. Maybe this is beneficial to other people. And you go, go on and become a professional organizer. And, and now you call yourself a simplicity coach. Is that a good synopsis? Yeah. Yeah. That's very good. I think like you need to be doing my bio all the time. You hit, <laughs> you hit all the high points in that. Yeah. Yeah. It started very much, like you said, from just like a personal need. And I, you know, I, I let go of about 70% of the possessions in eight months, but there was no plan there. I think that's maybe important for people to know. I didn't, even though I am very organized and I like my systems and schedules, with the minimalism and simplicity, I just was sort of led by the heart. Like, what do I need relief from? And I just sort of went around my house and just let go of the things that I no longer wanted to spend my energy on. So I didn't have a plan. I didn't have a curriculum. It just sort of like emerged and happened. And at a certain point, I kind of looked around and said, okay, I think I've touched pretty much every nook and cranny that I was willing to touch at that time. There were mm -hmm. things that I was not willing to touch that I, I dealt with later. But after, you know, eight months, the house was significantly different place than it had been, you know, eight months prior. And, and yeah, then I started sharing it. I was blogging. I started a private, just personal blog during that time while I was teaching. It was called Clutter Free Mom of Three. All of those oh, posts. That was good. <laughs> it, was, it was good. You know, I, I liked it, but I thought it was a little too cutesy. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But Clutter Free Mom of Three. So I started that blog and then that moved into my, when I started it as an actual business several years later, where I was a professional organizer in people's homes, I changed the name of the business to Less, which is technically still the name of my business. And yeah, and then I decided to just use my name for my, my stuff to make it easier. But yeah, that's how it all began. Let's talk about the, the hard stuff that you mentioned that you didn't want to touch. I know you've written about this at least a few times on your blog that I've saw, but you know, dealing with the emotional and sentimental items, I'm guessing a good portion of it you went through, you, you didn't have your own method of the, the two sorts, you know, and so you didn't necessarily have a process, but I think you probably identified some things and you're like, okay, I don't know if we need 25 coffee cups. There's two people that drink coffee in this whole household. So you could probably purge some of those. But then after that eight months, you're looking around and you're looking at some of these things. I mean, what, how do you advise your clients and, or how did you deal with some of the emotional and sentimental items, you know, either your teaching stuff or maybe your piano, if you wanted to bring in some personal examples or other examples that you have from clients. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I always tell people is when we're dealing with our stuff, we're not actually dealing with our stuff. We're dealing with our feelings and our emotions about our stuff. So I always recommend that people start where the emotions are easy. So like you said, I started with my towels. Well, I don't have strong emotional connections to towels, so it's easy to start there. So when you're getting started, you start with the things that you don't feel strongly connected to. Your identity is not wrapped up in them because it's easier. You'll make much faster visible progress. But really what you're doing is you're building up your muscles for the hard stuff. And so the hard stuff for me, the hardest thing for me was the teaching supplies. So yes, photographs and memorabilia, I did do some of that. And you're probably close to the end of that eight months. And I picked away at it a little bit over the years. But the thing that I would not touch were the teaching materials. So I had in my attic these boxes of lesson plans and unit plans and student examples and my entire classroom library. I was a middle school English teacher, all of it boxed up. And so every time you get the Christmas decorations out, you're stepping over it and that kind of thing. 
And, you know, the reason I kept all of it was because I thought, well, if I go back to teaching someday, I'm going to need these things, right? That's what I would tell myself. If you go back in the classroom, you're going to need these things. However, if I got a little bit beneath that reasoning, what was really beneath that reasoning? What was really beneath that reasoning was a fear that my business that I'd set up was going to fail. And if my business failed and my husband got hit by a bus and I had to pay the mortgage, I was afraid I wouldn't be able to do that on my own with my own business. And I would have to go back to teaching as a way to support my family and have health insurance. And so I was keeping the teaching supplies actually out of fear. Interesting. And so when I started to realize that, yes, it was wrapped up in my identity, but really it was a deep seated fear. And I was trying to stay safe by holding on to these things. They were my security blanket and they were my safety net. And I think you know, whoever's listening, whatever you actually struggle with, the thing that you're like, I would never let go of it. If you dig down beneath whatever reason you have for it, there's probably fear at the base of that reason. And you're holding on out of a sense of perceived safety, that this thing somehow makes you safer or more prepared by having it. And that that was what the teaching supplies were. And so what I realized was, Actually, these things weren't providing safety. What they were doing was preventing me from stepping fully into the life I truly wanted. Because as long as you're afraid and you're holding on to something, you know, if if skydiving, for example, which I would never do because I truly am afraid of that. (laughs) But like if you wanted to do skydiving, you have to let go of the plane. You have to jump out. You cannot skydive and stay in the plane. They, They negate each other. So I started to realize that these teaching supplies were kind of my plane and I was clinging to them for safety, right? But if I really wanted to have this business and have it be the way I wanted it to be, I had to let go of these things so that there was no safety net. It's like that whole burn the ships idea so that I I could pursue the thing I really wanted to pursue. And I even said, you know what? In the event that my business fails and Josh gets hit by a bus, It's not like I need these things to be a teacher if I actually, in a catastrophic situation, had to go back in the classroom and teach to support my family and have life health insurance, which I would do if that happened and I needed to. I know how to be a teacher without all this, (laughs) right? Like everything I know about how to be a teacher is actually internalized in my being. I could absolutely walk into a classroom tomorrow and teach some seventh graders how to write without any materials. I would be fine. So I even had to call like bullshit on my own excuse that it wasn't really an excuse. And so I I actually, I kind of practiced in my mind what it would be like to let go of all this. And I will tell you, by the time I got to this point, I had let go of it like slowly. Like I let go of the classroom library, the books, because I knew they wouldn't, they wouldn't stay good in my attic. So I had let those go. I had let go of like some of the extra supplies, like the glue sticks and the Sharpies and things that aren't going to stay good. And I had kind of winnowed it down to like the core stuff that could not be replaced, which were the lesson plans and unit plans that I had created myself, the student examples that my students had written that once these things were gone, there were, for most of it, there weren't digital versions of them. And once it's gone, it was gone. And it was like probably like four boxes-ish of stuff. I don't remember five boxes of stuff. It was the core. It was like the final, like little baby finger holding onto the plane. (laughs) And so I told a friend or two, like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it on Sunday morning. And I'm like, okay, I've told some people, I've talked about it. The Sunday morning comes, I get up. I remember it was February, it was snowing. I get the boxes out, I bring them down to the living room. My one son is up, he's playing video games on the couch. And I actually, you know, this plain example is actually really good because that's about how it felt. Like that level of like heart hammering fear is what I felt as I looked like, am I really going to let go of my entire former career in this moment? Am I really going to jump out of this plane? And so I open up like the first binder and I like, of course, it's all very organized as sheet protectors. I take the first little piece of paper out and put it in the recycling the page, take the next little piece of paper out, put it in the recycling. My son, Orlando asked me, he's like, mom, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm letting go of all my teaching supplies. And he goes, whoa, that's a pretty big move for you. He's like nine and he gets the gravity of the situation. And then he goes, if you keep doing it like that, it's going to take forever, mom. (laughs) Like piece by piece. I'm like, you're right. And so then I just like start opening up the three ring binders and just like dump in the whole things. And like the trash cans were 
heavy. They were like pregnant with papers. It was so much paper and so many things. And I felt like it was like a weightless feeling, like groundlessness, but not in like a super good way. Like it was kind of terrifying. And I like rolled the trash cans out to the garage. And I was like, all right, it's done. I would love to say this was like a really triumphant moment, but it was actually kind of this like, you really jumped out of that plane. Like you really did it. Like you let yourself fall. And, and I will say, I'm so grateful that I did it. I have never regretted doing it. It's been several years now. I've never regretted doing it. And I know that the successes and the, and the things that I've been able to do in my business have been a result of me letting go of my identity as a classroom teacher. I, I value the lessons and the things I learned from that experience. Like those things have served me so well in everything I do in my work now. But I am fully in, in my business. My business is not something that I'm doing as sort of like a little hobby break from teaching. My business is my career and it is what I do. And I'm not clinging to some other past career or identity in case this one fails. I've got this one in my back pocket. And so the mental shift that occurred because I did that is invaluable. Those four or five boxes were not taking up all that much space in my attic. It doesn't actually make that huge difference to me physically, space-wise for letting them go. But emotionally, mentally, it makes all the difference in the world. So, yeah. So hopefully that, that story helps somebody who's struggling with something difficult that, that yep. they kind of know they need to let go of, but it's really hard. I appreciate that story. I hadn't heard you fully explain that before. And that sounds like a really tough time for you. But I think that kind of demonstrates some of the power of simplifying your physical possessions. It's not only you're getting back some square footage in your home, but the mental bandwidth that it is giving you, which is actually why I think you made a great step from professional organizer to simplicity coach, because it is so much bigger than just my physical things around here. And I know you do a great job and you give a lot of good methods for, you know, simplifying or minimizing your physical possessions, but you've stepped into a, a really nice space with the simplicity in general. Can you delineate between minimalism and simplicity? Yeah. So when I first started, I called myself a minimalist minded professional organizer because the term that I knew people would be searching for me on Google would be professional organizer because I was going into people's homes at that time. So I knew I had to use that term. But even then, I was like, this really, I'm not about like bins and baskets and boxing all your stuff up in plastic and labeling it. Like, that's not really what I'm about. I'm about the freedom that comes from letting go of the stuff. Because I had recognized that in my own life. When I let go of the stuff, it was the sense of freedom and the sense of openness that it opened up inside. But I wanted to use a term that people would know what they were getting. And so I've always kind of attached like minimalist minded or simplicity minded to my work. And, you know, I came to it personally through minimalism, through reading minimalist bloggers. I wasn't reading organizing blogs. I was reading minimalism blogs. But as the years went by, what I realized was the term minimalism actually had, it's, there's some problematic things with that term. I think, first of all, it can sound like it's just about aesthetics and it's just about the way things look. So you think about minimalist art or minimalist decor, which is actually how the term used to be used before it was sort of used in this way. Yeah. And people often think that feels cold or it feels stark. And I had some clients who were like, I just don't like the word minimalism. It just doesn't sound warm. It doesn't sound like home. Like a minimalist home sounds like a, like a hotel, but not a place that people live and snuggle and watch movies together on the couch. And so I was, yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, I get that. But why minimalism wouldn't resonate with some people. And then I also think minimalism focuses to a certain degree, just on the stuff, like having the minimal amount of things necessary. And simplicity, when I started using that term, I realized that that just encompassed a lot more. Like, yes, you can simplify your stuff. And simplicity has a more of a positive connotation to it, mm -hmm. I think. And it can relate to your stuff, but you can also simplify your finances. You can simplify your health. You can simplify your schedule. You can simplify your relationships. And I just found that that term actually encompassed the things that I was really trying to get people to do. Like, yes, Let's simplify our physical possessions and organize them too, right? Because there is a space for organization. We do need organization, but simplicity must come first. But then that's not where this journey ends, right? This journey actually then continues. And in my own life, it continued because once I simplified my stuff, I pretty quickly like simplified my career, right? By letting go of my teaching career and embracing something new. 
I simplified my finances. I simplified, you know, as time went on my schedule, then that kind of internal simplicity that we talked about with sort of, you know, letting go of the perfectionism and the overachieving, that's an act of simplicity as well. And so that's kind of what I see as the difference between the two. I still do use the word minimalism sometimes, but more often than not, I'll use the term simplicity because I think it's more inviting. And I also think it's more accurate to the kinds of things that I actually help people do. I think that makes sense, especially if you're using it in outside of the physical possessions realm too, like minimizing your relationships or yes. simplifying your relationships. That makes way more sense to me. I'm not trying to minimize the relationships that I have, but right. in some instances, I am trying to simplify some of the relationships I have. And I see that, you know, with finances as well. I'm not trying to minimize my finances. <laughs> Maybe simplifying my approach is, is a more appropriate angle here. Absolutely. You got it. Hey, thanks for listening to The Struggle's Real. A quick word from our sponsor, and then we'll be right back. You know I love covering personal finance topics on The Struggle Is Real. I frequently get asked the question, how do I start investing? My suggestion, check out the Build Wealth by Investing course created by the founder of Personal Finance Club and friend of the show, Jeremy Schneider. This course includes everything you need to know to invest in index funds. And if you've been listening to The Struggle Is Real, you know I believe this is the most optimal, consistent way to build wealth. I don't believe in any gimmicks or get rich quick schemes. This course doesn't include any of that, but you will find investing broken down into easily understandable concepts and simple to follow rules. He'll also walk you through how to's, such as how to open up an investing account, how much to invest, and how to choose an index fund. Jeremy and his team literally built the personal finance course I wish was taught in school. If you are someone that wants to start investing, but you just don't know what to do, this course is perfect for you. This course also makes for a great gift for a 20-something getting started on their personal finance journey. You can check out the course using the link in the show notes or go to justinpeters.co forward slash deals. By purchasing the course through our link, you are supporting the show. So thank you for that, as that is how we continue to expand the show. If you want a teaser, check out episode 57 with Jeremy, where of course, I got to ask him a bunch of questions about investing, the cost of fees, and early retirement. Now back to the show. So our, my audience loves talking finances, and I know you kind of came from the professional organizing space and the minimal space, but then you found you were invited to Economy, which is a financial independence conference. So you spoke there, which is amazing. And you've kind of found this new audience or outlet of people that are looking for some kind of simplification. Tell me a little bit about your journey to simplifying your finances. Yeah. So the simplifying of the finances came pretty quickly after the simplifying of the stuff. So like I said, I'm an English teacher. So numbers are not my favorite thing. Like <laughs> I don't love spreadsheets. I don't love numbers. I will avoid them at all costs. So for most of my adult life, I was, I guess what I considered to be financially responsible, which for me just meant you pay off your credit card bill every month. That was what I considered to be, I'm financially responsible. I don't have credit card debt, so I'm good. And so a friend of mine, you know, while I was in the minimalism journey with the, with the stuff, she was talking about Dave Ramsey. And I'm like, who is this Dave Ramsey? Who is this guy? And so I started listening to him and I, I read his one book, Total Money Makeover. And I was like, okay, there is something here that we need to be doing. And I told Josh, I said, we are going to do this. We are going to pay off all the debts because, you know, my husband had law school debt. I had paid off my college debts by then. We had car debt. And of course, we had the mortgage to the house as well. I said, I want to be free. Dave Ramsey is telling us we're going to be free and we got to pay all this stuff off. And we have to start having a budget. We're going to keep a budget. And we're going to keep track <laughs> of everything. And he was like, oh my God, like, no, we're not going to do this. I said, and we are going to have cash envelopes every month. We're putting all the money in the envelopes, every amount that we're spending in cash. And he's like, oh, he hated it so much. And we, and so I tell you that because the way I started was probably not the way I would do it if I had to go back. However, what it was, was it was an act of taking control of this area of my life that I'd pretty much ignored. I didn't even really look at the line items on the credit card bills. I looked at the total and I wrote a check and that was how I managed my finances. I made sure there was enough money in the, in the checking account to pay for it. And so now I started investigating how much am I actually spending on groceries? How much are we actually spending on dining out? 
And I had my own spreadsheets at the time and we're using the cash envelopes to try to, and it didn't, it was clunky and slow and painful. However, it was very revealing and enlightening to see that the places I'm spending my money are not necessarily the places I want to be spending my money. Like, wow, we're spending a lot on dining out. Now, here's an interesting thing. You know, Josh did not like it when I made him have like a lunch envelope for like eating out, you know, for lunch at work. But that's something that he actually still does in cash. I don't do all of my finances in cash anymore. But he said, you know, if I don't have it in the envelope, I overspend. So I'm going to keep using the envelope. I'm like, I wow. win. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, so he did, he did get on board because he's also financially, you know, minded as well. So we started the budgeting and we had these kind of like painful hour long budget meetings every month that were were very painful. But it, it kind of got easier. Like as time goes on, like now we have we use Mint. So we have it all on an app. Everything like feeds into it. We can easily categorize and see how much we're spending. It's so much smoother now. But the way we started helped. So we paid off his law school debt pretty quickly. Just once I had the budget in place and we could see where we wanted to spend things, it was just clearer and we had a plan and we actually sat down and met and talked about it monthly, which we still do. Years later, we still have those monthly budget meetings, but they're really fast. And so we paid off his law school debt and then we, we paid off the car. I don't know. This has been a long time ago. I think we yeah. paid off the car first, paid off the car loan, then the law school debt. And then I said, okay, we're paying off the mortgage. And he's like, what? Now I have to give him huge credit here because he said very wisely, he's like, we should not just be paying off debts if we're not also investing for retirement. Yeah. And I think that that's the one thing that I would criticize about Dave Ramsey is he focuses so much on paying off debt that he doesn't really encourage what should be happening at the exact same time, which is investing for retirement because you can't get the time back. Yep. So Josh took it upon himself, thank God, to max out, you know, make sure we were maxing out IRAs maxing out his 401k. And I like tackled the, we're going to pay off this house in two years mm -hmm. side of it. And I was very intense about it, but we did, we paid off the house in like two years. And it was for me just this like awesome moment of freedom. Like we paid off the house. I remember when I went to pay off, like, and I was going to write the two checks, yeah. pay it off. And I took my kids with me to the, to the bank and we wrote the checks and I'm like, where's the band? Where are the balloons? Like, does nobody know what I'm doing? <laughs> The and teller's just like, congrats. <laughs> she said, actually, she said, congratulations. I'm like, <laughs> we don't get like a, like a drum solo for this. But then I took the kids out for donuts and I, cause I wanted That's them cool. to know like, this is exciting. This is a big thing. And now here's the funny thing. The next day, literally, I had lunch with Diana Merriam, who is the founder of the Economy Conference about being a speaker at the inaugural Economy Conference. And here I am thinking like, oh, yeah, I can talk finances. I just paid off my mortgage. Like, I'm awesome. And she's like, you know, this is a conference about the fire movement. I'm like, what's the fire movement? And so she explains to me what it means, financial independence, retire early, and all these people investing. And she's talking about how she does her own investments. And I'm like, I've got a financial person who does that for me. And she's like, well, you got to think about what their, you know, their fees are. If they're taking one to 2%, how that compounds. I'm like, you have to think about that one to 2% and how it compounds and how they might be actually getting a lot of your retirement by you paying them to do it and not doing it yourself. So I actually, what's funny, you know, cause I'm an achievement oriented person and I, I beat myself up here. I thought I'd reached the pinnacle and the literal next day I realized like there's this whole other mountain that I didn't know existed. And now this person who I perceived to be much smarter than me has revealed my ignorance to me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, now I have to learn about all of this. And how can I speak at this conference when I don't even know what these people are talking about? Anyway, it was just the perfect catalyst for me to learn how to invest on my own. And we fired our financial advisor and we started investing on our own in Vanguard. And we have budget meetings every month and we tally up our net worth and we're much more conscious about saving for retirement. I feel like we are in a really good position and I just feel really blessed that, you know, my introduction to financial independence was being asked to speak at a conference about financial independence when I knew really nothing about financial independence. But as a result, I met people, I learned. It's really exciting. So that's kind of my journey to financial simplicity. But a lot of it, you know, we talk about letting go. A lot of the letting go was letting go of ideas about my ability to manage money. So I thought, I just don't do numbers. So I ignored budgeting. Well, you know what, Rose, you, you can manage numbers. You're as smart as anybody else. You can make a spreadsheet and figure these things out, even if it's not perfect. 
And then letting go of this belief that I wasn't smart enough to invest on my own. Like I'm going to let my financial advisor do that for me. Well, you know what? You could read some books and listen to some podcasts and probably be about as smart as your financial advisor and do it yourself. And so it was, it was really shedding this idea that finances was hard. Money was just too difficult to manage. Nobody really keeps a budget. Like all these things that I told myself, it was letting go of those ideas that allowed me the space to actually create systems that have put me and my family in a much better financial situation. And even my boys, like what they want for their birthday this year is they want to create accounts at Vanguard. And I said, anything that, oh yeah, they're like, that's Any, cool. I said, anything you put in, we will match. So for their birthday this summer, we're going to try to set the accounts up for them. So, you know, so it affects their future as well. So, yeah, so that's the simplicity in my own personal finances. And, and I know that it was a result, the mental space that I needed to tackle something like my finances that really overwhelms me, that mental space was created as a result of decluttering my physical possessions. So I think that's an important link to realize that, yes, you declutter the physical possessions, you have more physical space. What you really have is more mental space. With more mental space, you can think and dream and plan and do things that you could not do when your brain is cluttered with worry and anxiety about your physical stuff. Yes, that is exactly why I like to have a clean house. I like to have clean spreadsheets. I like to have clean everything so I can spend my time thinking about the things that I really do want to spend my time on. And that is so cool that your kids want to open up Vanguard accounts too, especially at the age that they're at too. And if you help them or guide them towards their journey of FI as well, I mean, they could be, it, it could be crazy how fast they could hit these numbers with compound growth. And I know I'm preaching to the choir there, but <laughs> that is very cool that you rubbed off on them. And you brought them in, showed them you paying off the mortgage. You've gotten them involved with finances. I'm assuming they at least subscribe to your methods of simplicity in all areas of life. So that's that's really cool that you're making an impact. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's just like anything, you know, the way the parents live, you know, the kids take notice and not necessarily that they will. Like my daughter, my boys are very much into the finances. My daughter is more like, eh, I want to go buy ice cream and stuffed animals. So, you know, it's not like all my kids are 100% on board. So with her, I have to really do more probably intentional molding because she's not motivated by money. But I'm hoping that the lessons that I'm imparting on her will help her or she'll remember them later in life. Like you have to put some money away. You don't just spend your entire allowance at the ice cream store. So yeah, so yeah, it's, it's changing the story for my kids. And, you know, I think my parents, they were both teachers. And so they had pension funds. And so we never really, we didn't have a lot of money because they were school teachers, but we didn't really talk about, they did not talk about money except maybe in like a stressful feeling way. They didn't know about investing. And what's funny, my, my mom just got a little bit of an inheritance from her mom who passed away. And she's like, what should I, and she came to me to ask me, you know, what should I do with it? And so I was like, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put it in Vanguard and this is how we're going to invest it. And it's really fun to be able to help her as well, you know, to manage things in her life. Wow. From the novice to the practitioner to the expert now on finance. Right? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I'm an expert. I, I think you know quite a bit of knowledge and you could definitely help people in that space. But Rose, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I've had such a blast. Researching you was a lot of fun too. You have this wide ranging content out there, everything from organizing tips to simplicity and kind of the, the abstract thoughts around what simplicity can do for you if you embrace it. So it's been, it's been so much fun with all of that. Where can people find you? I've mentioned the blog. I've mentioned a few different talks that you've had. Is there a good place, maybe a landing page that people can go if they want to consume more of Rose? Yeah, the best place to go would be my website. It's roselounsbury.com and Lounsbury is spelled L-O-U-N-S-B-U-R-Y. Like a dog buries a bone, not like a strawberry. <laughs> so roselounsbury.com and there you'll find my blogs. You'll find a link if you want to sign up for a free live webinar with me. You'll find all my resources for different programs and things that you can be involved in and social links if you want to follow along on social media. You can find those there as well. And we'll drop that in the show notes for anyone that's on the go right now and can't write that down. But Rose, my final question for you, you know what's coming. If you had the opportunity to teach a 16-week class to a group of graduating college seniors on a topic that isn't normally covered in the classroom, what would you teach and how would you teach it? So I just love, I love this question so much and I spent quite a bit of time thinking about it. And so, okay, there's a lot of alliteration in my answer here, <laughs> but it. the class would be called Simplicity, Savings, 
and success and self-worth. So it's simplicity, comma, savings, Oxford, comma, and success and self-worth as a unit at the end. And here's why um, simplicity, obviously, because I wish that I had started to adopt some of the mindset of simplicity in my 20s. I spent a lot of time wasting my money at the mall and going out to eat and going to see movies in the theater. And I think, you know, if I had adopted simplicity and just realized, like, I didn't really need all those things, I didn't need to be shopping at TJ Maxx and Target because I was bored, it probably would have served me better later in life. So I, I wish that I had the ideas of simplicity earlier. Savings, all of the reasons that we've talked about, I didn't have a belief in myself that I could really invest or have savings. I didn't understand how the stock market worked to me. That seemed really scary to put your money in the stock market. I had this belief that other people should manage my money for me. We also pretty much spent everything that we made when we were in our 20s. Like Josh got his law firm paycheck. And we're like, more money than we've ever had. Let's go spend it. And that's what we did. So savings would have been helpful. But the real meat of this 16-week class for me would be the last section, which is success and self-worth. Because when I look back at my 20s, and I, I spent some time thinking about this because I think, you know, when you're in your 20s, it's, you're coming right out of that time of life where a lot of your, at least for me, my self-worth was determined by the, the grades that I got and the things that I achieved. And when you're in school, you know, grade school, high school, college, it's pretty obvious you know, if you if you evaluate your self-worth by grades and achievements, it's actually really clear and easy to do it, right? Because you got an A in the class, or you got a 4.0, or maybe you got a B minus, so you didn't do as well. But it's really easy to, to evaluate yourself. Then you get out into the real world and you're trying to use those systems that you've learned and they no longer work. Because in real life, there's no A pluses, there's no B minuses. I was a teacher, so even if I stayed up late and had the best lesson plans, and they were the most organized, guess what? My paycheck is the same as the person down the hall who's like showing up hungover. It, it really, what happened was I started like trying to achieve and achieve and achieve to be successful because I was so dependent upon those external markers to feed my self-worth. And it became more and more frustrating because there were no A's. There's no A in mothering. There's no A in work. There's no A in life. And so I think, you know, this kind of circles us back to sort of the beginning of our conversation when we were talking about overachieving. And I think in my 20s, if I had been able to really define success for myself, it would have made a difference. And my definition likely would have changed over time. But I 100% bought hook, line, and sinker, the traditional definition of success as you, you know, make a certain amount of money, you have a certain type of home, you drive a certain type of car, you live in a certain kind of neighborhood, you have certain kinds of friends, you go to certain kinds of events, you look a certain way, you have kids by a certain age. Like I had bought into all of that as success, probably the traditional American dream. And, and, actually, and, and the reason is because I felt like if I had all of that success, then I was a worthwhile person. And so I was using it all to feed my sense of worth. And I did that for, for a couple decades and just within the last several years have started to really like unravel that, that template that I sort of was living my life by. And what's interesting, I'm a big fan of defining things on your own. And this was just a few weeks ago. My best definitions come to me at like really unexpected moments. So my definition of simplicity is getting very clear about what you want and then having the guts to let go of everything else. That came to me in the parking lot at the YMCA when I was going to work out one day. <laughs> My definition of success came to me a few weeks ago. I think I was like picking up dirty laundry off the floor. And it was like suddenly I was like, success is living a life that feels true to who you are. That is my definition of success. So even if my business failed, nobody ever signed up for coaching with me again. My programs had zero people. All my Instagram followers fled. My Facebook groups dwindled to zero. The only people on my email list were like my mom and her friends. If all of that happened, like my, as an overachiever type person, those, my biggest fear is public failure. So that would be public failure for me. But at the same time, if I had an epic marriage, if I felt connected and aligned to myself, if I was in nature every day, if I read as many books as I could my entire life, if I wrote something meaningful every day, and if I had no freaking regrets about how present I was with my kids during their childhood, 
I will have had a wildly successful life. And so what that definition helped me do was realize that the only definition of success that I should be relying on is my own. I'm open to that definition changing, and my definition of success I would have written at 25 would be different than the one I have today. I would have, I would have a different understanding of it. But I guess that's what I would encourage your listeners to do is if you sense that you're stuck in that, that trap or that cycle of defining yourself, your self-worth, your value by your external accomplishments and achievements, define success for yourself. What does success really mean to you? And, and you know what? Look at people who you consider successful and why you consider them successful, and it's going to help you come up with that definition. One of the most successful people I know is my neighbor across the street, Beth. Why? Because I can hear her laughing hysterically with her family on her porch almost every night. She sits out there with her husband and her kids and they talk and they laugh. Beth is an incredibly successful person. It has nothing to do with her profession, her career, how much money she makes, her achievements. It's because I can tell she's living her life to the fullest. And so that's why I think in my 20s, having some space to consider these concepts of success and self-worth and where they intersect and where I actually want them to intersect and where I don't would have been so helpful to me. So hopefully that's helpful to your listeners as well. Rose, that was a mic drop. You brought it home. <laughs> yeah. Such a good answer. Love the title of the class. Love the premise of the class as well. One of my favorite answers that I've gotten here on the podcast. So Rose, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for spending some time with me and, and really looking forward to staying connected. Oh, thank you, Justin. It's been awesome. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you like this conversation today, be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified about new episodes. If you want to connect with me, send me a message on Instagram. I'm at Justin Lee Peters. You can find show notes with links to everything we discussed today at justinpeters.co. This episode was produced by Gabby Dimeke. I'm your host, Justin Peters. Thanks for tuning in.